Office of Hispanic Affairs. Um, as you came in, everyone, you got spoons. Um, they are in wrapped in a bandana in honor of our presentation, Kipchona. So please enjoy these spoons that have a message of love and gratitude on them from us. So, um, sorry, guys, I like did not have this in my sorry. <laughs> so this afternoon, we have Yadira Gurule. Yadira is from um, Albuquerque. She is a curator and visual arts manager for the National Hispanic Cultural Center. Um, and today she will be presenting on the Chicana Feminist Architect, La Chola. Um, before we begin, you guys do have surveys on the tables. Please fill them out so we can get more extraordinary programs such as this one. Um, and if everyone could please give me, oh, not me. <laughs> if everyone could please help me give um, Yadira a great hand welcome. Thank you so much. Can everybody hear me okay at this tone? Okay, cool. Um, thank you for having me today. My name is Jadira Gule um, from the National Hispanic Cultural Center in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and super excited to be here and really honored that I was invited to come and speak about this subject matter that's uh, very near and dear to my heart. Um, yeah, so before I get started though, I did wanna take just a moment to acknowledge that we are currently on indigenous land. Um, in the state of New Mexico, we have 23 sovereign indigenous nations and the impacts of settler colonialism are ongoing and continue to affect us. Um, so I just wanna thank the original people of the lands here in New Mexico, here at EMU in this space in Portales, um, across the United States, across the world. Um, and I'm really honored and grateful to be here and able to share my with you all today. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is a little bit about me, just so you know who's up here talking to you, and a little bit about the NHCC, so you have a sense of the place uh, where I work and also where this exhibit that I'm going to talk about today was hosted, and then we'll do a lot about Kichona because that's the fun part. Um, it's all fun. But <laughs> so a little bit about me. Um, periodically my head turns into a piñata emoji. <laughs> Uh, we did a Pagata exhibition in 2016, and um, you gotta mess around sometimes. You couldn't pass up the opportunity for Pagata emoji head, you know? Um, <laughs> but I was born and raised in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Um, I got my bachelor's degree at the University of New Mexico <coughs> in art history. Um, at the same time, I started interning for the National Hispanic Cultural Center, um, basically trying to figure out what do you do with a degree in art history. <laughs> um, and uh, I took a little break from interning, went back to school, um, got a master's degree in American Studies from UNM, and that's really where I started to kind of hone in on some of my interests in um, culture, identity, race, gender, sexuality, and social justice, and in particular, the museum's role in social justice. Um, so that really informs quite a bit of my work. And, um, in 2016, I was hired at the NHCC as a curator, and then within the last year, become the program manager for the visual arts program there. Uh, let's see, anything else about me? I think that's enough. Oh, actually, that's not enough. Uh, <laughs> one of the things I wanted to say about the center really is that, especially in honor of, of Women's History Month, is that it's been a place where I have been um, able to work with a lot of amazing women leadership. I've been mentored for years and years and years through that place, and so I wanted to take a moment to pay respect to the people who have really made it possible for me to be here in front of you all today. And also, if we all want to give like a round of applause for our mentors, because I'm sure there's many of them in this room, and if you're not one yet, you will be one. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So a little bit about the NHCC and the Art Museum. Um, the National Hispanic Cultural Center opened in the year 2000 in the Barales neighborhood of, the, of Albuquerque, New Mexico. So it's a neighborhood kind of in the southern part of, of the city. Um, the center as a whole is a multidisciplinary cultural center. So we have a performing arts program with three theaters. We've got a history and literary arts program that houses a genealogy center, an archive, and a library. We have an education program that works on public programming for children and adults of all ages and um, does that in relationship with all of the other programmatic areas. And then there's the Art Museum and Visual Arts program where I come to you all from. Um, we are a collecting museum, so we have a permanent collection that lives on site of just under 4,000 artworks. 
Uh, we are really excited because we are embarking on a pretty major digitization project of our collection. So within the next few years, our collection is going to be really accessible to the public online. And uh, we're just getting started, so wish us luck, but we're excited to make that possible. Um, the center as a whole and the museum, our mission is global in scope. So we work with artists who identify as New Mexican, Hispanic, Chicana, OX, Hispanic, I never can say the letters all together, Latina, OX, A, uh, Latin American, and more. And certainly, you know, all of these terms are like huge umbrella terms for a lot of diversity that happens within, within them. That would be a talk for a different day. Um, but we work for them. <laughs> and then um, the museum works really hard to be a first voice institution, meaning that whenever possible, the artists that we work with, the community members that we're working with speak for themselves in the museum. That looks like a bunch of different things. Sometimes they write artist statements or the text labels, or um, in this case in my presentation, I'm gonna try to read from artist statements and share some videos of the artists speaking for their work. So, any questions on that part, institutional part so far? Okay, cool. So the exhibition. Quechola <laughs> um, was an exhibition that we had um, at the National Hispanic Cultural Center in 2019. Um, so it's been actually a really interesting process putting this talk together and reflecting on something about four years later um, and the way that we continue to be impacted by this project and the work and and the lessons that I've learned through doing it. Um, kind of overarchingly, the exhibit was about cholas and homegirls in art and popular culture um, from a Chicana feminist perspective, celebrating la chola as an archetype and as a symbol of strength and power and resilience in the face of um, racial, cultural discrimination, economic adversity. Um, at the time, and I think this is probably still true four years later, uh, some of the inspiring factors for the exhibit were um, there was an increase in popular culture interest, and I don't know if anybody remembers, but I think Gwen Stefani, who you just saw, <laughs> um, had a performance where she kind of dressed up like a chola. Um, there were like makeup tutorials on YouTube where you could go, and it was like cholas teaching you how to do your makeup. Um, there is a pretty significant subculture in Japan um, where people are interested in Chicano culture here in the United States and don a lot of the aesthetic. And so sometimes this was like celebratory and sometimes this was derogatory. So we were interested in just kind of unpacking what that popular culture dynamic was all about. Um, and in doing so, kind of trying to challenge some of the stereotypes that were a part of this pop culture. Um, certainly, cholas uh, have a really long-standing presence in uh, Chicano culture and art. And of course, this was also inspired by then the personal histories of many of the women whose life experience we're talking about um, in this type of project, and uh, and they're sharing sharing with us uh, those experiences. So, and here you'll see this is Al Chola, which is a clothing apparel brand um, in uh, local in Albuquerque. Uh, so they do lots of shirts that play on the kind of linguistics of the New Mexico speak and Chola speak um, and a really cool style. And so they did like a refurbished paleteria cart to the bicycle as an installation of music. So I wanna, um, I'm gonna enter what I call the disclaimer portion of this <laughs> presentation. There's kind of a lot of them. Um, this subject matter has a lot to do with labels and identity categories. And um, I think it's worth kind of thinking about that for a second as a group, because some of the labels that we identify ourselves with are a source of pride, um, cultural connection, uh, maybe a sense of purpose they come with. But then, you know, in other cases, we have labels that are thrust upon us that we don't necessarily identify with. Um, so is there anyone in the audience who might be willing to share some of the labels that you identify for yourself? For example, I um, identify as, um, as a cisgender woman, but also a daughter, a sister, a partner, and a friend. Professional sometimes. <laughs> okay. 
Oh, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I always identified it with Chicana. Chicana, okay. And thank you for bringing that up, because I'm going to talk a lot about Chicana identity, but I think, um, just as an anecdote, I remember being 13 and asking my dad if I was allowed to call myself Chicana because I was mixed and really kind of exploring what it means to be Chicana and also really appreciating the kind of political charge sometimes that Chicana has. Um, but even as a teenager, I was like, I want to be Chicana. <laughs> um, but sort of the point here is that um, labels are tricky. Um, the ones we identify ourselves with and carry proudly um, can be, again, a source of like pride and belonging and amazing things like that. But in other instances, they can be kind of problematic, right? Sometimes they help us create really narrow and strict definitions of who people are that can flatten out the complexity of who we are as people. Sometimes they can contribute to stereotypes. Um, and for the most part, most of us don't fit within one singular identity at any given time. Most of us are a little bit more complex than that. And I mention that because I'm talking about a label and like using terminology and I just want us all to be like cognizant of the fact that that can be kind of problematic to do. Um, and we're doing it in a celebratory way here, but um, it has its negative connotations. Um, so also, this is my other question. <laughs> I promise I won't do too much audience engagement, but... Uh, <laughs> can I just see a show of hands of who has heard the term chola before? Oh, yay, it's like almost everybody. That's cool. I have to ask that question because depending on the room, it's like a really different answer. Um, so in this particular case, um, most of you will probably be pretty familiar with what I'm talking about. Um, Hopefully then this presentation is an opportunity to like think a little deeper and celebrate the figure of La Chola. Uh, for those of you who have never ever heard this word before, um, I think you might get it by the end, maybe. <laughs> uh, okay. So I do present just a, again, a very hesitant definition because I don't really believe in like defining people strictly. Um, but just to kind of ground us here, but again, I think almost everybody knows what I'm talking about, so this is normally for the people who have no idea what I'm talking about, but... Um, so the term chola refers to women of a particular, usually Chicana, Latina, but definitely not always, um, subculture in the United States, <coughs> characterized by a cultural pride, a kind of tough demeanor, and a distinctive style. Um, she's a figure that many young Chicanas grew up admiring or emulating, um, because she really symbolizes that like youthful rebellion, um, the sense of strength, the sense of you can't mess with me, um, in the face of difficult circumstances, uh, cultural, racial discrimination, gender discrimination, economic adversity. Um, and then as a historical figure, the Chola has, I think I mentioned this before, been featured in Chicano art for decades, and she's really become this kind of archetype um, in the Chicano imagination. More disclaimer, because people are dynamic <laughs> and we change. Um, so basically, you know, the, the chola attitude, which is like the essence of her power and like this thing that you can't entirely describe, um, can't really be contained within the boundaries of a label or a definition. And so I think um, I'll just always encourage us to think a little bit more broadly about cultural expression, human expression. Uh, because we all change and grow. And so the exhibit as itself was really meant to be honoring cholas and um, what they can teach us about ourselves. And so not to say that any of us should like go off dressing up like a chola after this, definitely not that, but, um, <laughs> but to think about the ways that they can teach us about how we construct a sense of self for ourselves, um, how we interact with our identity, cultural and otherwise, and then how we respond to um, to our life experiences and cultivate a sense of belonging with other people. Um, this piece on the side here is by Delilah Montoya, Chicana artist, um, a photograph that she'd taken of, I think, one of her neighbors. And I have a video, if I can make it work, thank you, um, by Delilah talking about what it means to become a Chicana artist. Thank you. 
Hi, my name is Delilah Montoya, and I am from Albuquerque. However, I do teach at the University of Houston. I consider myself to be a Chicana artist. It's an identity that I brought on to myself early on when I was actually a teenager. And I decided that I was going to become a Chicana artist. And nobody knew what that was. I didn't know what that was. But I thought what I was going to do was find out. And I've spent the last really long time just really learning and thinking about what that is. You know, what are the aesthetics? What are the things that are important? How do I create that voice? Creating series and ideas and things that begin to give our community an identity. And that's one of the things that, you know, in my work I, I tend to do over and over again is to really begin to speak about that identity. The idea was to create work for my own community. you're going to hear throughout this presentation is the term subculture and um, again I think you know I, I want to just say that like this subject matter wasn't something that the museum decided to engage with lightly um, we were trying to showcase this really important Chicana feminist perspective on what the Chola means symbolically but also remember that we were talking about real people and also remember that there's always the potential to accidentally be trafficking in stereotypes when we didn't need to do that. So we were trying to think really carefully about how we presented the material. Um, and so the use of the word subculture is um, kind of a contested term. A lot of scholars point out that it's problematic to talk about um, any particular culture as subordinate to a more dominant culture or a more mainstream culture. And I think that that's a really valid argument to make. Um, however, I'm also using it more as like a tool to talk about intra-cultural diversity. Um, so I think I mentioned before some of those like really big umbrella terms, right? Hispanic, Latina, Chicana. Um, but there's like a huge range of identities that happen within these categories. And so when I talk about subculture, I don't at all mean subordinate. <laughs> I mean just kind of like a subcategory within a dominant or a not dominant but a more overarching uh, term so that we can get to some specificity. This piece here um, is by Gaspar Enriquez. Uh, it's called La Patsy Los Homeboys. Um, they're like life-size figures that he created. They're gorgeous. Um, and that was the entry piece when you would walk into the exhibit. So you could kind of walk up to her and she's like staring down at this whole way. Awesome. Um, so I have a video from Gaspar as well. My name is Gaspar Enriquez, and I was born and raised in El Paso, in El Segundo Barrio. Uh, I now live in San Elisario. You see, I was born in El Barrio, and when I went to California and came back, and I started teaching in the same neighborhood I grew up in. And most of the, my students were, well, a lot of them were chorros or chorros. So I started recording them in my paintings. I, I want people to take from this exhibition from my work is to uh, have the inquisitive mind to want to know who these people are and where they come from. Uh, we all are looking for an identity. And to acquire this identity, we, we dress like that and we acquired uh, the language of Kalo so they, we can distinguish ourselves. Cool. Um, so some of the recurring themes I think you're probably starting to pick up on, I've been talking about this whole time, <laughs> which is this practice of fashioning a sense of self and thinking about the ways that we um, sort of adorn ourselves or cultivate a way of talking or a certain type of language or a way of walking, a particular attitude, um, certain accessories, the way we do our hair, all of these things when we're trying to cultivate something that we want to show to the world, a sense of self. And oftentimes we do that in relationship to other people and there's a mentorship relationship involved in that. Um, so 
I think the sense of belonging and then also the solidarity amongst women was something else we wanted to talk about. Um, and I'll go into it a little bit more here in a bit. Um, I think it was also worth noting that the Chola persona offers an uh, opportunity to challenge normative gender roles. Um, so that's something that comes up quite a bit, is that rather than thinking that women have to be like quiet and nice and just dress like this, cholas are like out there in your face, speaking up for who they are and what they think. Um, sometimes they're dressing in similar clothes to men and they're tough and in the public sphere and it, absolutely this is one of the reasons why I found Chola to be role models when I was young is because I'm like, oh, look, these women need to go out and be brave and do all of these things. And really kind of taught me how to cultivate a different way of thinking about what it meant to be. Um, and then of course, in the face of uh, cultural discrimination, as I have mentioned, um, you know, that sense of cultural pride and coming together um, is important as well. Uh, some of the scholarship informing the exhibit. Um, there's a lot of people who've written articles and books um, at this, working with this subject matter. Uh, two of the really influential women for me were Rosalinda Fregoso and Catherine Ramirez. Um, and so these scholars really highlight uh, that interconnectedness between the Cholas resistance to racism, resistance to poverty, and the challenging of gender norms. Um, in this really kind of intersectional way where all of these things are happening together and creating this really um, uh, a persona birthed in resistance. Um, and, you know, so they also note that while um, her story is told, uh, you know, kind of through the lens of stereotypes in, in many ways, like the complexity of that life experience of who she is, of what motivates her and all of the other things happening in her life is something that doesn't happen as often. So certainly the exhibition was engaged in trying to do that work as well. That's not a great photo. <laughs> now I realize that it's on the big screen. Um, but this is by Judith Baca, a Chicana artist. Um, it's called Absolutely Chicana. And she here, um, creating an image that's more along the lines of the Pachuca aesthetic. So I want to note that Cholas and Pachucas are historically related. Pachucas would be the World War II era precursors to Cholas, um, kind of the suit suit era. Um, but both deeply connected in, in battling you know, discrimination, cultural discrimination, poverty, um, through cultivating a rebellious way of being and a rebellious lifestyle. Um, so, Pachucas and Cholas, really. So, in the exhibit, we um, had 29 artists from across the United States, most of whom identified as women. Um, they were working in different styles and different media, but what they all had in common is that they were highlighting and celebrating the Chola persona, the Chola aesthetic, um, and the elements of the strength, this attitude, um, and the kind of challenge to normative gender roles. I'm going to show a few examples here. Um, this piece is by Antonia Huerta, who is from Denver, Colorado. Uh, she created this oil on canvas in 2018. Um, and in her artist statement, she says, quote, Pachucas were part of the movement to free women of stereotypes. This painting embraces and celebrates the modern day Pachuca, free, beautiful, and bold. So here, Antonia is really making a connection between um, Pachucas of the World War II era, era and the modern Pachuca. Um, this piece is probably even one of the most popular ones we had in the exhibition. Um, actually, I had a lot of like little boys come up and be like, oh, that's like my sister's room where she gets ready, and like really identified with it. Um, and we were lucky enough to be able to purchase this from the artist at the end of the exhibition, so it is a part of our program. Um, so this piece here is um, actually four selections from a larger body of work. Is anybody familiar with the East Side Stories albums? Okay. So 
These artists from the Bay Area, Amy Martinez, Vero Mahano, and Carrie Orvik, created the Q-Sides, which was um, a project to basically restate the images of the East Side Stories album covers, which are like, for those of you who don't know, like kind of uh, anthologies of oldies, like low riding, uh, cruising music. Um, but they all had these like images on the front of like homeboys and different things like that. So they restage all of them to insert queer identity into this imagery. And it's both about, well they explain, Q Sides is a series of photographs that challenge long held assumptions regarding the traditional exclusivity of heterosexuality in low rider culture. Um, so they're both using this as a tool to gain visibility for queer gender expression, but also um, to talk about the fact that, that the queer gender expression has always been there and sometimes it doesn't get acknowledged, but this is, you know, uh, these are people who have always been a part of lowrider culture, Pachuca culture, Chola culture, um, and we stage the photographs in the movie. Um, I'm highlighting these two here. On the left we have a piece uh, by Valerie Bauer. It was a series of photographs. She did a photo shoot with the young women um, here in this photo. And then on the right, there's a, a piece by brother-sister duo Adriana and Benjamin Avila um, called Homegirls from their neighborhood. And I think these two just kind of demonstrate that quality of Chola culture, right, which is about like having your homegirls and having people that have your back. Sometimes that looks like teaching each other how to cultivate the aesthetic. Like I certainly remember getting taught how to like mount my eyeliner with a lighter. I don't know if anybody still does that, but, uh, <laughs> but um, you know, when like looking back on it, I'm like, oh, this is like how we teach each other, how we develop these friendships, how we develop bonds. And in many cases, it's also how we teach each other to like survive in difficult circumstances by having <coughs> Another thing. This is Cola Lopez, um, who also had work in the exhibit. My name is Paula Lopez, and I am originally from New Mexico. I am a painter, uh, and I work in acrylics. The painting is all about the feminine energy and the fierceness and beauty, you know, of that energy and the way that Cholas kind of represent to me the Kualique goddess. Kualique was the Aztec goddess that they unearthed in Mexico. And she was so intense and so scary that when they unearthed her by accident, they put her back because she scared them. But um, somehow, you know, Cholas have that same kind of vibe, you know, they kind of scare you, but maybe they're very attractive. And I think that they share a lot of characteristics, you know, in that they're solid. And I've been living in LA for 16 years now, and I had never really been exposed to that kind of chola lifestyle or the, that subculture. And um, now I have a good feel for it, you know. So I really respect them. And, you know, it's the kind of woman that you don't want to, we don't mess with. They're not afraid to speak up for who they are. Uh, this piece here is by the artist Pamela Enriquez Ports, who is originally from LA and now lives in Las Cruces, New Mexico. Um, she created this triptych called Rep for the exhibition. And she says, quote, each woman stands proud and wears clothing that represents who she is today, as well as the legacy of her ancestors through textiles and patterns. Um, so one of the things that Pamela does um, extraordinarily well in her work is clothing and patterns like all of the way she was clothing is just absolutely gorgeous um, so in this particular instance she did some research on different indigenous motifs that would have happened in textiles and are happening in textiles throughout mexico and the southwest and then um, decided to kind of update those motifs and um, you know make the outfits that the cholas are in um, but for her, it's really about connecting um, the contemporary with ancestors as well and making sure that that influence is always carried through. And this piece is by Nani Bachacon. 
Um, I don't know if anybody's familiar with Nani's work. Nani's a mural artist, so at least in Albuquerque, she's got murals all over the place. Um, amazing painter. Uh, she created this piece called La Onda um, in 2011, and she says, quote, subtleties in movement, cliches, style, and stance are all a nuanced language created for the people, by the people, cultivated by time, understood by experience. And I think what Nani says here is actually really important because what she's alluding to is this idea that there's like this whole persona, this whole language, this whole way of being that's really um, meant for each other and it's maybe not meant for everybody else, which is completely okay, right? Um, but, and it's cultivated over time. It's part of this community identity and I think it's a beautiful way of describing. My last video. This is by uh, Chiran Hell, who also had work in the Hi, my name is Julia Van Hale. I was born and raised in Fillmore, California. I'm the artist who generated the work of uh, Las Negro. So my work derives from the original Loteria cards developed in 1887. From that, I was able to go ahead and uh, make a new generation of Chicano Loteria series with a series, a narrative, if you will, of how each aspect and component of the Chicano culture is uh, developed in or has been created or have been a uh, subculture of the main culture of Chicano culture. In this, we have the title, icon, and number that give that historical discourse, that narrative of La Chola. In this case, it's La Shy Girl. And so what I'm trying to create within this context of this whole narrative is for the people who don't know otherwise my culture, for them to for them to kind of start seeing and asking themselves, title, icon, number, what is that all about? What is that historical narrative? And what is the message I'm trying to convey? And is that for them to go ahead and to continue on with these questions to further themselves into that whole history of uh, La Chola or the Chicano culture? artists and also part of what we were looking to do um, was kind of increase the desire for cultural understanding and inquisitiveness and wanting to learn about each other um, so we also ended up having a lot of conversation about the difference between cultural appropriation and cultural uh, appreciation um, and and part of that I think, was coming up quite a bit in relation to the subject matter because Cholas were experiencing this like increased interest in popular culture. And sometimes that led to people kind of donning the aesthetic when and end up being really disconnected from the lived experiences that it's birthed within. Um, and also forgetting that we're talking about real people, right? It's one thing to talk about art and symbolism and archetypes, and it's another thing to remember that we're also talking about real life experiences. Um, so certainly, I think the conversation around appropriation and appreciation changes depending on what it is. And certainly, if any of you are interested or working in the cultural field, it's a conversation to have all the time. <laughs> And the answer changes, and it's a complicated one. Uh, but I do think in this particular case, right, it asks some important questions as food for thought. Um, so thinking about, is there such thing as cultural ownership? Um, what is the line between cultural appreciation and cultural appropriation? Um, and does popular culture always traffic in stereotypes? Um, these are the kinds of things that we found ourselves like really having to grapple with as we were moving forward. Again, trying to be really careful that we weren't like inadvertently contributing to stereotypes for people who didn't really know what we were talking about. Um, so along the lines of real people, um, one of the things that we tried to do to kind of ground again and like a sense of community and the real people who identify with what we were talking about, um, we did a community photo board. And for that, we did a call where we invited in um, and basically people to send in photographs of themselves, their family members, their friends, kind of rocking the chola aesthetic. We had a huge response to this. Um, so you can kind of see, it's not the best picture of the photo board, but in the distance, there's the photo board. And um, 
through that process, we actually get to meet this group called uh, New Mexico OG Veteranas who came to, like I sent in so many photographs and they were all amazing and they came to the exhibit, we got to meet with them. Um, so then at the end, we did a farewell party. Um, so the last day of the exhibit, we decided to kind of throw a party. We had lowriders on the plaza, food trucks, artists were selling their artworks. Um, and then we also wanted to have an opportunity to do kind of like a fashion show um, and an opportunity for women to come and share their stories and experience on stage in the museum. So we created kind of like a little catwalk that went through the exhibition. And then it led up to the stage that um, was in front of this piece that's also by Nani Bachecon. Um, and honestly, it was like probably one of the most powerful moments I've had to have in my, I've been able to have in my career. And I'm really honored that I was able to be a part of it because it became just a really amazing experience of like this whole energy of just people supporting each other, women sharing their stories, talking about the difficulties they experience, talking about their triumphs, um, and all of us kind of coming together, sharing what we've learned. Um, it was multi-generational and um, you know, this also happened the day after the shooting in El Paso. Um, I wasn't going to mention this part today, but I think it's worth noting because it, it really contributed to to why that day was so important. Where um, it otherwise would have been a pretty cold party, but it was also a moment for people to come together um, after something really horrific had happened, and that was making us fearful for gathering and uh, collectively in places and. Um, and so it was a really beautiful moment, and I'm honored to have been a part of this project as a whole, and that day in particular. Um, so just to kind of finish up and summarize, I'll say, um, sorry, I have it here written somewhere. You know. um, basically, I'm thinking about why this exhibition was so important and well received at its time and certainly why the meaning that it continues to carry now. And I think that part of it is because it reminds us to maybe think twice before we judge. Um, it reminds us that community is important and particularly as women, advocacy and, and supporting each other becomes really important. And then I think there's that element that reminds us like to be rebellious and to cultivate a sense of challenging, willingness to challenge the status quo and to try to create something, um, you know, as cheesy as it sounds, right? Like, but a world where all of us can thrive and to do that together. And um, yeah, it was a really powerful experience for me and I'm really grateful that you all let me come here and share with me today. So uh, with that, I can take questions. <laughs> Of the rose, mm -hmm. I have heard of a few different symbols of the rose in general. Um, this was one that we decided to bring in um, for the graphic, graphically into the exhibition as a symbol of kind of like love and honoring and beauty and life. But do you have a different? Well, I'm, I'm just going through the etymology of the word, uh -huh. you know, because it would be Aztecs, okay. you know, language. So. That was that was where it, you know it came from, but I didn't know if there was another study that you had done. Oh, I'm sorry. Did you say rose or word? I rose. might have missed her. Uh, like you have the, the rose flower, in, okay. you know, because that's one of the symbolism. But it was it has like you say before a lot of the connotation of the religious belief, like you know, Lady Guadalupe, the right. roses, and all that. So I just didn't know if you had another. I mean, I'm. I love that you put that, yeah. you know, so. I think, I mean, the rose as a symbol has like such a range of meanings and certainly you mentioned Guadalupe, I think yeah. there's always that connection to kind of celebrating the woman and motherhood and, that, and her as an icon of protection. Um, so kind of touching on all of that. Plus it looks really good. You did a super presentation, I mean, I wanted to say but the rose, I just gave another thing. Yeah, and I'll say, um, yeah, 
all of the exhibitions that happen at, at the National Hispanic Cultural Center. You know, in this particular instance, I was a curator, but I worked with um, really closely with one of our interns at the time, named David Theis, who's now getting his PhD off at Princeton. Uh, <laughs> but also, there's a whole team of people that um, make all of this possible. Um, including our, our set and exhibit designers and graphic designers. So pretty much everything we do is, is really, we're a collaborative team. So um, when we come up with the rose and the font and the paint colors and all of that stuff, it's happening in discussion with each other. Was, was there a gallery for that exhibition? There was, I was it Unfortunately, I didn't get, this is just the struggle of the museum sometimes, I didn't get my funding confirmed until after it had opened. So we were like, oh, do. Um, so I wasn't able to develop a catalog, although we are exploring some ways to maybe kind of go back, get in touch with some of the artists. Certainly this is an exhibit that um, could be done a bunch of times over um, since then and with more work um, as possibly possible. Well, each one of you, you, you maybe should have that same, captured that sense of strength, of pride, rebellion, all the, all the things you talk about, each one of those, each Artwork is perfect as a pop. I would like to see a full book out of it. Hopefully, we can put something together. Yeah. You mentioned fashion and these things. about this exhibit sometimes people were like oh you don't have cholas in New Mexico that's like an LA thing and trying to have like being like well that's not true but sometimes it's manifestations are different um, so it could depend on like the particular aesthetics of a place um, but I definitely think Catholicism is related I'll also say like me growing up not raised Catholic like in a Catholic environment but my parents didn't raise us Catholic um, it was like iconography that was familiar to me and part of the aesthetic and the style and also had this kind of comforting it part to it um so i think probably it can like do different things for different yeah. people 
to. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah, I only ask because a lot of my family members dress like this and experience the culture. They did a lot of the So I was just always curious if that was kind of a symbolization throughout the whole Chola Cholo or if it was kind of variety. Yeah. yeah, I definitely think um, you can see the influence. But you can see the influence of Catholicism on like Chicano art, you know, much more broadly as well. Especially kind of how she mentioned about the roses yeah. and the significance of the, the Virgin Mary. Um, so that's one of the things that I, I, I would say, no, <laughs> um, and one of the points that we were trying to, oh. yeah, well it is a, it's a great question because this is coming up a lot, especially with like the videos and performers kind of downing the look. And there's a lot of critique. Like you barely have to Google on the internet where people are like, stop dressing up like cholas if you don't know about the history where this comes from and this is not your personal experience. Um, and certainly, sometimes those arguments can get a little challenging, right? Because they start getting into the realm of like authenticity and sort of we're asking ourselves, well, what does it mean to have the right experience to have this thing and the cultural influences and whatever. And certainly I've asked myself this about my teenage years as well. Um, so, but that said, I think the point would be more to think about maybe similar types of things that are happening for ourselves, um, the ways that we're kind of, kind of think about belonging, cultivating sense of self, having the rebellious spirit, um, all of those things, but I wouldn't necessarily advocate for anybody dressing in <laughs> uh, if it. If, you, if you've never, if it's not your, if you weren't inclined to do it thus far in life, it's probably not the time. Uh, definitely not for Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> I think that would be a great example of appropriation. Exactly. Yes. And again, so exactly that. We were having this conversation around, um, and that gets into the crux of appropriation because, you know, artistically, culturally, human beings share and borrow from each other a lot over time. Um, where do we get into the parts where there's different power dynamics happening um, to the point where someone may be able to adopt a look but also take it off when it becomes problematic and for others maybe not so much that. Um, and so I think thinking about the power dynamics of like when we borrow cultural things is important. What are some uh, similarities and differences between Pachucas and uh, Chorla? So Pachucas uh, have like a different era. So that would have been more 1940s, um, 50s. So some of the uh, like aesthetic and like uh, style would have just been different because of the different times. Um, so I think in the image by Judy Baca, she's trying to kind of mimic the more Pachuca style. Um, so that you can kind of see the relationship, and this isn't the best image or example necessarily, but you can kind of see the relationship between like the hairstyles changing over time, um, certainly like the eyeliner and the makeup and things like that, but I think it's just the era is probably what makes most of the difference there. Um, and certainly like the expectations of femininity um, in the 1940s is super different than the 70s and in the 90s um, and so all of those things are kind of morphing and changing over time too. Would you, to talk on to that, would you say that the role changed or throughout the time as well or was it just a spectrum? I would say the roles changed. So I, I think, um, I guess it's probably, the community. yeah, yeah, probably. Um, I mean, I think there's this interconnection between like the aesthetic as like a personal expression, but it's happening in tandem with um, kind of facing difficult circumstances around class and, um, and cultural discrimination, as well as gender oppression and all of these things kind of moving forward in tandem together and changing in tandem. I don't, you know, 
think it could be really interesting to dress up maybe in the flannel version and time travel into the 1940s and see what that would have been like, but obviously... Well, I guess I'm curious about too, now that we're in 2023, right. how has digital femininity changed? Like, are they, is it okay to... I guess I'm saying, is the current 2023 Chola more or less of something than the 1990s or the 1970s, right? I think, um, or just say like the, the culture is sort of homage historically, so to maintain that sort of the peak, I guess. So maybe there's studies that just carry on, but it's not continuing to evolve, is it? Well, no, I think it is actually. One of the things that I also saw recently was, um, there was like a memes coming out that were like Chola Scholar and stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think. Maybe that's like an additional iteration of this, which is like opportunities and access to things maybe is changing over time, uh, but people are still really connected to that identity and like where they came from. Um, I think it will never stop evolving over time. Um, how Because I know that a fascinating like spin-off is to actually look at symbolism within tattoos. We're working on an exhibition right now actually um, of <coughs> paños. Are you all familiar with paños? Um, so paños that it means it's like a little handkerchief um, but typically is are artworks that are created um, by incarcerated artists on handkerchiefs. Um, so we were able to acquire a collection um, by Rudy Padilla. He collected it before he passed, and we bought that in 2019, and so we got some support from the Ford Foundation, and we're working on that project. Um, and so there's a lot of questions around the significance of tattoos also coming up in that, so we're starting to dig into some of the research around um, just the meaning of different tattoos and symbolism, but certainly there's a lot of cultural identity you know, with tattoos as well, um, and sometimes I think group affiliation in that way. Possibly both. I think it, each individual's motivation uh, would be different, but I think, I think, yeah, I think there was probably a lot of moments where it was mostly kind of dominant culture, especially if we kind of think back about the 1940s. Um, and the zoot suit riots and a lot of the stuff that was going on, we're talking about really significant uh, d discrimination, uh, class differences and violence, um, and starting to really kind of cultivate a distinct identity that is kind of rebellious to, to what they're experiencing, this experience, <coughs> and carrying on because these experiences didn't necessarily go away, right? They might have just changed in nature. So I think there's that kind of rebelliousness, but probably some intracultural rebelliousness as well. Um, particularly, I think sometimes around maybe like gender roles and expectations. But again, I don't want to like, I'm speculating here because like, <laughs> um, some of this is like research, some of this is, um, you know, even the scholars that I highlighted before, a lot of them are talking about their personal experiences and some of it's poetic and we're, you know, um, so this is where like talking about culture gets really tricky because it's like you have this feel and you kind of think about what's going on and are trying to explain it, but I don't necessarily want to speak for anybody's experience. So my answer honestly probably relates to my own personal experience. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, I just wanted to ask anything else? Well, thank you so much for having me today and uh,
Um, in honor of you making all the drive over here from Albuquerque from Multicultural Affairs, we would like to present you with this Women's History Month teacher. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. I really, again, super honored that you invited me here today and um, an opportunity to revisit this project that was very important, also terrifying in the moment to do because it's a very complex one. Um, so thank you. Hold on guys. Okay. <laughs> um, I would like to run everyone to please fill out the service in front of you. They're really important. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. Our next event will be Kyla Lacey. Um, she is... We're doing a free luncheon with her and the creative uh, expression. Um, it's a collaboration with ACB. It'll be it'll go from 11:30 a.m. to 1 p.m. Um, and stay afterwards with us to talk with Dr. Luncheon. Um, she will be talking the stories with a Caribbean woman. I'm so sorry, guys. I'm just about to. It's after spring break. I'm so sorry. Uh -huh. um, she will be presenting uh, the stories about Caribbean women at 2 p.m. in the room. So join us for lunch. Stay for the presentation. Um, and I hope everyone has an emotional year today. Thank you. Oh. Thank you.